I, I was persuaded by the debunking uh, websites that uh, they'd refuted all the allegations made by the conspiracy theory. To me, because I've been a professional political scientist, the most obvious refutation is that had the Americans ever attempted to fake going to the moon before the Soviet Union, the whole Soviet propaganda machine would have blown the whistle and indeed blown the trumpet very loudly and made a huge song and dance of it. And they were very sheepish and didn't uh, do anything of the sort. It was, of course, easy for Soviet radar and Soviet radio telescopes to track the, all the six Apollo expeditions to the moon and back. No communications were encrypted. They were, in fact, televised worldwide at the uh, time. Today's lecture will look at the present, which I broadly conceptualize as half a century from 1970 up to date, taking up the thread from where the Apollo moon project uh, ended. And there is one quite astonishing achievement of engineers, particularly United States engineers. Back in the 1950s, everyone took it for granted that building uh, an observatory in space, an orbiting observatory, or any space probes would of course have to be manned spacecraft because you need the crew to point the telescopes to aim the instruments at whatever you're looking at. And by the 1960s, the advances in technology, the advances in transistors, in horizon centers, sensors, in star sensors, in gyrodynes and reaction wheels, had all advanced sufficiently that it could be done automated by robotic space probes. And we'll look at the extent of these achievements as the years go on. Today's lecture, which is why I'm wearing this t-shirt, we're going to take a journey of discovery and exploration through the solar system from the sun right out to the outermost dwarf planet, Pluto. And uh, discover all these new facts. Most of these robotic space probes were built by Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Everyone knows it as JPL in Pasadena, Los Angeles in the USA. A few others were built by the Applied Physics Lab at John Hopkins University. I got on a public tour of JPL in 2009 and also got as far as the foyer of the Applied Physics Lab, where I gave a talk to some of the engineers about our Southern African Large Telescope. They firmly insisted they wanted engineering talk. They didn't want to hear policy things. They were horrified that I was a, a political scientist. And some of the other space probes were built by a great variety of different institutions and universities. Now, our sun, this is a photo taken through special filters, and what it depicts is huge flares on the sun, which you can see both from directly above, and also how at the side, those flares soar up along the magnetic lines of force of the sun's magnetic field. But of course, we see the sun from its equator around there, and lots of the fine details are blocked out by our atmosphere, except when there's a total eclipse of the sun, and then astronomers get a chance to see the corona around it from the Earth. So in 1990, the European Space Agency and NASA have been negotiating on each launching a space probe to explore the sun's details. And NASA had budget cut after budget cut, so it backed out. And the Eurospace Agency went alone with its spacecraft named Ulysses. So there was only one and not two Ulysses. Now, Ulysses did not, in fact, approach the sun any closer than the Earth's orbit. What it did was to be launched away from the sun towards Jupiter to use Jupiter's gravity as a slingshot to fling it up to an orbit perpendicular to the plane of the solar system. So it would orbit fairly close 
over the sun's north and south poles, although at the same distance at the Earth. And that is a uh, drawing of the Ulysses solar probe. It was checking if there's differences in the strength of the magnetic field near the sun's equator, which you will pick up from the planet Earth, and in its polar regions, which are quite different. Then with advances in technology, last year NASA launched the space probe Parker, which is going to come within 6.8 million kilometers of the sun. We are over 100 million kilometers from the sun, far closer than any space probe before. And the reason that this couldn't be done before is that it has to have a thermal shield, which will be for weeks on end at a temperature of 1,370 degrees Celsius. So you must take that without melting, and the insulation must be so extraordinary that on the shade side, it never goes above room temperature, even with that huge heat facing the front. So it's an extraordinary challenge which only advances in material sciences has allowed to be done today. Then there's an additional engineering nightmare. As well as protecting the whole solar probe from the heat by being in the shade of its thermal shield, electricity is generated by photovoltaic cells. And those photovoltaic cells have got to be exposed to the sunlight in order to generate electricity. Now, most photovoltaic cells will, in fact, wilt in efficiency even at the boiling point of water, 100 degrees Celsius. There are optimal temperatures around room temperature or colder. So the engineers had to invent a complicated system that the solar cells will peep out over the edge of the sun shield while a refrigeration mechanism from behind cools them down so they don't melt and go defunct. So this probe will be reaching the sun or close to it in a year or two. And it will explore the outermost parts of the sun's corona and check for charged particles and other details which the astronomers have not been able to uh, detect until now. We move on from the sun to the first of what astronomers call the four terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, in order from the Sun. Now, Mercury has always been a nightmare for the astronomers on Earth to observe. Mercury only appears very low on the horizon through the thickest atmosphere, so all photos are so blurry you can't see anything. Mercury only appears in twilight, so the photos are even weaker than usual. And Mercury only appears close to the sun, and astronomers are very nervous of pointing any telescope at it, because if you made any mistakes, the focused sunlight would melt your telescope with a horrific bill for damages. And finally, in 1974, NASA launched the probe Mariner 10, which you see at the top left of that slide. A Mariner 10 made navigation history in another way. It was the first space probe to use what is called gravity assistance to change direction or to slow up or to speed up the uh, velocity of the space probe. It's an example of what mathematicians call the three-body problem. And Elbert Bruno was the, one of the mathematicians who pioneered using the gravity of a passing planet to re-aim the space probe and to either slow it down so it will move closer to the sun. Uh, in this case, the space probe had to be slowed from the Earth's speed around the sun so it would fall towards Venus's orbit and then slowed down by Venus's gravity so it would fall closer to the sun until it could reach Mercury's orbit. And the Mariner the 10th photographed about half of Mercury, revealing that this airless planet has been smashed all over by meteorites 
and it's covered with craters very similar to the moon. And then in 2011, another probe called Messenger photographed the remaining half of the planet. So it's now, in total, we got photos of 94% of its surface. The M Messenger probe is in the bottom left, and it too, you can see, has to be covered by a thermal shade because already by Mercury's orbit, the sun heat is well over the boiling point of water. And the amalgamated images stitched together more easily in a digital era than in the 1950s. There is a uh, photo of one of the hemispheres of Mercury. We now move on to the next second planet out from the sun, Venus. And this is another infuriating uh, uh, problem for the astronomers before the space age, because Venus is the only planet which is totally shrouded in cloud. So you can never see its surface, however hard you uh, uh, try. And the Soviet Union took the lead in firing space probes towards Venus, and then each one would be uh, braked by, by uh, aerodynamic braking, and its radio would record it's descending and descending, and then suddenly all signals would stop. It had been crushed by the pressure. So the Soviet scientists would build a stronger probe with thicker uh, walls and send that off to Venus, and again it would descend and descend, and while descending, suddenly the signals would stop. It had again been crushed by the pressure. And this carried on six times, until finally in 1970, at the seventh attempt, the Soviet Union got radio signals from a probe until it had stopped descending and was sitting still, proving that at last they had reached the surface of Venus. And the reason the six previous space probes uh, had never made the surface is that they measured pressure at 90 atmospheres, that is, <coughs> 90 Earth atmospheres on Venus's surface. That is equivalent to the pressure one kilometer below the surface of the Earth's oceans. Such pressure would crush like eggshells the three submarines in the South African Navy, which can only dive 100 meters below the surface in safety. And the Venera 7 lander also measured the surface temperature at 465 degrees Celsius. That is almost enough for the rocks to glow red hot and hotter than the planet Mercury is. The reason for this counterintuitive situation that the second planet away from the sun is hotter than the closest planet to the sun is that Venus's enormous atmosphere is carbon dioxide and it is a classic case of a runaway greenhouse effect and a warning uh, to the planet Earth to be alert to this issue. Now, the Soviet Union continued sending landers to uh, Venus. The CCCP is the Cyrillic alphabet letters for USSR, quite confusingly to us English speakers. And finally, uh, Venera 13 and Venera 14 in 1982 took the first color photos of Venus's surface. Venera 17 survived only two hours before melting, and Venera 14 survived one hour before melting. You can see at the bottom of the spacecraft there's a large sphere, and that is made like a bathysphere because it's the best shape to resist the crushing pressure on the uh, steel vessel. And those are the first photographs dating from 1982 we ever got of Venus's surface, and to date, four decades later, they're still the only color photos we have from Venus's surface. In the top image, you can see the edges of the uh, Venera 13 lander and part of a lens cap which has been ejected. 
and then you can see there the pebbles and the rocks and the gravel on the surface and the bottom photo we can see lots of loose rocks lying on the surface of Venus glowing the yellow with all the sulfur uh, in the atmosphere so that is an achievement which no one has equaled since next the United States engineers had the way of uh, solving the problem of Venus shrouded in cloud, they sent a radar-equipped space probe called Magellan to orbit the planet Venus, and this, of course, used radar to penetrate the cloud and map the whole surface. And what it showed us was fascinating, a first for astronomers, that there's very few craters on Venus, as we'd expect such a dense atmosphere will burn up or meet you <coughs> before they hit <coughs> the surface. But <coughs> what the radar did show was a number of extinct volcanoes on Venus and flows of lava, which of course at such a heat would flow further than on the planet Earth before the lava would freeze and be immobile. So that was a great scoop for astronomers. And in 2015, the Japanese space agency JAXA launched a probe called Akisuki, which is analyzing the atmosphere and its layers in more detail. Well, continuing our voyage out from the sun, next we have Earth's moon. And uh, on the left you see the near side of the moon familiar to us, with those falsely labeled seas, sea of tranquility, etc., which are really plains of frozen lava, which has not been molten for billions of years. And as I mentioned, our culture sees those as the man in the moon. Some African cultures see it as a woman carrying firewood on her head, and the Chinese culture sees it as a rabbit. And on the right-hand side, we get a view of the far side of the moon showing much smaller planes and simply craters everywhere. In the, yesterday's lecture, I mentioned that the United States' huge success, which included as a scoop for geologists, bringing back to Earth over 300 kilograms of moon rocks, uh, which were distributed to geologists at various universities around the world, mostly, of course, the USA, but including one sample for UCT's Professor Louis Ahrens. Well, the Soviet Union sent a number of robotic space probes over it. Some of these failed, but of them, the one called Luna 16, which you see in the picture, and also Luna 20 and Luna 24, that long uh, arm scooped up gravel from the surface, deposited in the cylinder on top, which is actually the ascent rocket, which blasted off the moon's surface and uh, came back to Earth, where Soviet geologists got samples. These were far smaller quantities of rocks than the American astronauts brought back. It was in total 320 grams of rock from these three probes, but they came from different sites that the Apollo astronauts had landed at, so that was very useful to geologists in mapping the soil differences between different parts of the moon. The Soviet Union also, during the 1970s, launched two moon rovers called Lunar Cod 1 and Lunar Cod 2. There you see in the other photo, a model, a life-size model of Lunar Cod 2. It has got eight wheels which are made out of wires rather than tires. And the big lid you see opening on the top has got inside it the photoelectric cells to provide the electric power to uh, propel it. And of those two Lunar Cods, the one called Lunar Cod 2 traveled for 42 kilometers across the surface of the moon before it broke down. And that 
held the record for the distance of any rover on another celestial object for 41 years until passed by one of the US rovers on Mars. More recent times, China has landed a probe on the moon called Chang'e, and that uh, released a lunar rover called Jade Rabbit, which operated from 2013 to 2016. And last week, I had to update these lectures I prepared a month ago, because China has just now landed its Chang'e 4 on the far side of the moon, the first probe to land on the far side of the moon ever, and down those little um, tracks ran its next moon rover, which you can see there in the middle of the slide, called Jade Rabbit 2. And Jade Rabbit 2 is the first moon rover to be on the hidden side of the moon, so that's rather fun to know. Now, continuing our journey through the solar system, the next planet out is Mars. And the, the joy of the, today's images, if I look at the popular space books and encyclopedias of my child in the 1950s, all you can see is a very blurry orange ball with hardly anything else visible. But the image on the left, you can see clearly Mars's north and south polar ice caps. And when that hemisphere has its winter season, the ice cap is overlaid by dry ice, that is frozen carbon dioxide on top, which will evaporate or sublimate in the summer. The slide on the right shows some of the surface features in more detail, and the big one you can see running in the center from left to right is the uh, largest chasm on Mars. It is far bigger than the Grand Canyon of the United States. And when astronomers went back to look at those sketches the Sieval Lovell had made in the 1880s and 1890s, where he claimed his eye could see through a telescope canals on Mars, which were always too faint to show up in any photos. We can see here that one of the things he thought was a canal at the limits of vision was, in fact, this huge canyon running across Mars. So he wasn't entirely wrong peering through the blur of the Earth's atmosphere. Now, all told, we have 21 orbiters, landers, and rovers that have been to Mars, orbit around Mars, since 1971. There's eight defunct orbiters, which still continue to circle Mars indefinitely. And as we speak, there are five orbiters going around Mars that are still sending signals back to Earth. Four are NASA ones from the USA, and one is India's first Mars probe, Kumangal Yarn, which was launched in 2013 and is still operating. The United States has sent several rovers to Mars, of which two are still operating. One called Opportunity, which reached Mars in 2004, so it's been operating for 15 years without going to the garage for a service. And what you see in the bottom slide is the American rover Curiosity. You can see it's got six wheels all there. And what the slide depicts, it's a painting, is Curiosity firing a laser beam at a rock. This evaporates some tiny sample of the rock, which is spectrograph, then picks up the vapor and analyzes it. So we can actually do a geological analysis of the soil on Mars without bringing a sample back to Earth. And this is, again, a very impressive advance in US engineering, which could not be done in the 1970s or the 1980s. So Mars has the record for the number of space probes sent to investigate it with our fascination with that uh, planet. Now, the next planet out, we've left the terrestrial planets, and now we come to what astronomers call the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. 
What the astronomers mean is that we're not yet sure if the planets do or don't have a small rocky core in the center, but all we can detect is that they overwhelmingly are huge balls of compressed gas, and they are vastly bigger than the size of the terrestrial planets. From the, the Earth, telescopes will show uh, a blurry image of Jupiter's belts and zones, and the famous Great Red Spot, which has been a storm ranging for at least several centuries since astronomers uh, first picked it up. And the first space probes which went past Jupiter were Pioneer the 10 and Pioneer the 11th, which flew past taking close-up photos in 1973 and 74. Then, in the 1970s, some of NASA's mathematicians picked up a very exciting opportunity in what they call orbital mechanics. And that is, once every 170 years, the planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto are aligned in such a way that if you aim a space pace probe to fly past Jupiter, you can use the planet's gravity to aim it at Saturn, Similarly, you use Saturn's gravity to aim it at Uranus, the same to aim at Neptune, and then to aim at Pluto. So this provided an opportunity of a lifetime, or more precisely, the opportunity of four generations of lifetimes to explore all those planets with much less propellants and fuel than you would otherwise need to do from one a space probe. But the astronomers planning this had to make a sacrificial choice. Some of them wanted to explore Saturn's biggest moon, Titan, which is unique, they argue, because it's the only moon of any planet in our solar system that has an atmosphere, and a thick atmosphere thicker than Earth. By contrast, the fans of Titan argued, Pluto is just simply bigger and fatter than any asteroid but it's the same as any asteroid. So there's nothing to gain by looking at Pluto. So they made the choice that the space probe would go to aim at Titan and would sacrifice the opportunities to see Pluto. What they didn't know in the 1970s was that Titan, the same as Venus, is totally shrouded in cloud, so the camera saw nothing. And we had to wait another two decades before they finally NASA scraped the funds together to launch a special separate space probe, a Pluto, which we'll explore a bit. Returning now to Jupiter, the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 space probes in the 1970s were designed to fly past most of the outer planets, and then they would leave the solar system to wander through interstellar space in the Milky Way for billions of years to come. And so Carl Sagan and other astronomers debated, it's theoretically possible that sometime millions of years hence, some alien uh, civilization will actually capture in a butterfly net the space probe from Earth wandering between the stars there. So to tell them something about us on Earth, each of Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 had a gramophone record and the needle of a gramophone arm put on it, on which they recorded various majestic musical passages from symphonies in the different musical uh, styles on Earth, and also the word hello in about 50 languages. Now, I can imagine if aliens actually did pick this up, they will spend ages trying to translate this uh, message, thinking it's a number of different words in the same language, and not realize it's the word hello in 50 different languages. So uh, good intentions might often fall uh, flat. Well, the Voyagers 1 and 2 both went past Jupiter in 1979. Subsequently, NASA's launched more than one probe towards Jupiter since then. The probe called Galileo weighed two tons. So as time went on, the space probes got bigger and bigger. 
That was launched in 1989. It included a German propulsion module, so it was an international effort. On the way to Jupiter, it passed an asteroid called Ida and made the discovery that nearly as tiny asteroid had got its own moon, which astronomers named Dactyl. This was the first known case where astronomers discovered a moon orbiting around an asteroid. We now know of several such cases. And Galileo orbited Jupiter for seven years until the intense radiation fields around Jupiter destroyed its camera's electronics. The Galileo probe also discovered that the moon Io had a plasma torus extending to Jupiter's surface and picked up that the moons Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto have beneath their frozen ice surfaces got a subsurface ocean which is liquid and not frozen. They detected this by the gravitational tides in the moon as Jupiter's gravity tugged on the ocean and the moons differentially from the rocky cores of those moons over there. And finally, in 2011, NASA launched a probe called Juno. And this was interesting to me, launched on a United States rocket called Atlas V that is propelled by Russian engines. So again, there was an international, uh, international dimension to this. And the Juno probe was launched to again fly over the poles of Jupiter. And that produced a big surprise for astronomers. From the Earth, even through the largest telescopes, you see Jupiter as seen on that image there. It's got belts and zones, which astronomers took it for granted, went all the way to the poles. But when Juno flew over the south pole of Jupiter, it saw something quite different. Southern, beyond the southernmost belt, there's in fact a series of cyclones, quite chaotic, which aren't arranged in any order of a belt or zone. So that's a sort of complete surprise which astronomers have got, which you cannot see from the planet Earth at all. This is a slide depicting the space probe Juno. And in another engineering advance, it was the first space probe to be that far away from the sun, which could use photovoltaic cells to generate electricity. At Jupiter, sunlight is only one 84th as strong as on Earth. So before that, space probes had used a radioactive isotope to generate electricity so far from the Earth. And it's another engineering advance to be able to use photovoltaic cells in such faint light. And another discovery of Juno is that Jupiter has got auroras, just like the planet Earth. And there you can see the northern lights on uh, Jupiter. Another discovery is credited to Linda Moribito, a image analyst at NASA. And looking at images of the Jovian moon Io, one of the four big Galilean moons, she spotted, you can see on the horizon, a plume. And this was the first discovery of a volcano anywhere <coughs> away from the planet Earth. And what it was, it's <coughs> uh, sulfur being blasted <coughs> by pressure 100 kilometers above Io's surface, where gravity makes it fall back onto the planet's surface. Jupiter's gravity keeps nearly all the planet melted in molten sulfur with a relatively thin crust. And we now know that at any one time, there's five or six active volcanoes on Io erupting, then going dormant, and erupting again. This was another NASA discovery. The next planet out in the solar system is Jupiter and its famous rings, and that's similar to how we see it from Earth. Pioneer the 11th flew past 
Saturn in 1979. The two voyages flew past in 1980. And then, more recently, teams from 21 countries, including NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Italian Space Agency, launched a large probe called Cassini Huygens, named after two famous astronomies, astronomers of earlier centuries. And the Cassini probe was designed to orbit Saturn, and Huygens was designed with radar to map the surface of Titan and then uh, be a lander which would land on <coughs> the moon uh, Titan. And again, when the um, Cassini probe flew over Saturn's North Pole, those uh, bands that we can see uh, running across the planet over there, which is the view we get from planet Earth. I should mention here, the colors have been deliberately, very heavily exaggerated to make visible to the eye the different bands and zones on Saturn. But when we go over the North Pole, those circular bands astonishingly change to a huge hexagon storm, which is continuously uh, rotating as the planet rotates over there. And this hexagon pattern is very stable. So that was also completely unexpected. Then turning to the moon Titan, some more fascinating discoveries were made. When the radar penetrated Titan's cloud, it found that on the moon Titan, there are lakes of liquid methane. That's the dark areas in the slide. And the rest of the moon's surface is covered by frozen methane. And the astronomers detected that the moon Titan is the, so far the only known other body in the solar system beyond our planet Earth which has a complete hydrological cycle. That is, methane evaporates from the surface. It forms clouds above Titan. From the clouds, it condenses into methane rain, which falls onto the surface as those lakes. And in most of Titan, the methane freezes solid as methane ice. So we have it like water existing in three phases, gases, liquid, uh, and solid. Then the Cassini probe flew past Saturn's other moons and made another fascinating discovery of something far too small to be viewed from the planet Earth. The moon in Calidus had, and near its south pole, a series of big cracks, you see in the top left slide, which the astronomers named tiger stripes. And when the Cassini probe flew over the tiger stripes, it detected salty water spray uh, hitting the space probe. And the bottom right photograph uh, highlights in infrared some of the uh, salty spray being blasted out of geysers. And the astronomers calculate that some of these frozen salty crystals go into orbit around Saturn and comprise what astronomers call the E-ring in the number of different rings around Saturn. So that was a very interesting discovery. The next planet out from the sun is Uranus. Two, uh, a color photo taken through a telescope. The planet simply has a very pale green tinge. Here the colors have again been deliberately very strongly exaggerated so the naked eye can see any bands in Uranus's atmosphere. And on the right, you can see those pink cyclones there. Uranus and Pluto are the only planets in our solar system whose axis of rotation is tilted almost perpendicular. So it would have very astonishing seasons there, where the polar rings and the tropics rings would completely overlap each other hugely. And the Voyager 2 space probe also discovered 11 moons around Uranus, which are too small to be seen from Earth. And the next planet out 
from Earth is Neptune, which Voyager 2 flew past in 1989. That is after a 12-year voyage from uh, Earth. And here it showed, you can see in white, there are some clouds high above the blue clouds in Neptune's uh, atmosphere. And these are the fastest winds known in our solar system. This was also unexpected because uh, meteorologists will associate uh, winds with the sun's heat accelerating air, and Neptune is indeed very far from the sun and very cold. Finally, in 2006, uh, NASA launched the New Horizon space probe, which left the Earth at a record speed of 16 kilometers per second. And at that speed, it took nine years to reach dwarf planet Pluto. Already by the time space probes reach Saturn, it takes the radio waves between an hour to an hour and a half to come back to be received from Earth. And from dwarf planet Pluto, it takes the radio waves four and a half hours to actually come all the way back to Earth. And the New Horizons <coughs> probe returned six gigabytes of data to Earth. From the biggest telescopes <coughs> on Earth, Pluto is such <coughs> a tiny disk, you cannot resolve any detail on it. And what New Horizons discovered, you will see on the left, is a Pluto which averages minus 222 degrees below zero, has mountains of frozen methane, which at that temperature, methane is almost as solid as rock, and it's got a, in the white area, is a f lake of frozen nitrogen. Nitrogen is at that temperature a slushy solid. The rectangle has been enlarged at right, and that views some of the mountains of frozen methane on Pluto, and they've also discovered sand dunes of methane uh, grains uh, since then. Then the New Horizons probe flew past Pluto's biggest moon, which is called Charon, and is unique in the solar system for a moon being one third as big as the planet it orbits. And near the north pole of Charon, we can see a maroon's blob or splosh. And the scientists speculate that it's probably complex hydrocarbon molecules where the methane and nitrogen have, with the sun's ultraviolet rays, been uh, merged to, to catalyze to form more complicated chemicals. The other feature that fascinated the geologist is around the equator of Charon is a huge crumpled up ridge of mountains completely circling the equator. And the astronomers hypothesize that after forming, Charon might have cooled and shrunk in size, so the surface crust already frozen got crumpled up to form this big ridge of mountains. Well, that ends our tour of the solar system almost until last week when New Horizon probe went past an even further asteroid of the Kuiper Belt called Ultima Thule. And what his cameras detected is that Ultima Thule consists of two boulders, each about the size of Table Mountain, and their mutual gravity has made them come to touch each other. But it's not one rock, it's just two touching ones over there. And that concludes our tour through the solar system. The next fascinating achievement is NASA's series of orbiting observatories. And the first of these we'll look at is an X-ray telescope called the Chandra Telescope in honor of Subramayan Chandrasekhar, a very distinguished Indian uh, physicist. And this was launched in 1999 from the Space Shuttle Columbia. Now, 
Building an X-ray telescope is an engineer's nightmare. What astronomers do, of course, for light, infrared and ultraviolet is to reflect it off a silver mirror, or more precisely, uh, a mirror covered with a layer of aluminium deposited on it. But of course, X-rays will just go right through the glass. So how can we focus the X-rays? And what they discovered is that if you have a series of stainless steel tubes nested one inside the other, where an X-ray strikes the tube a glancing blow, a very low degree of incidence, those X-rays will not go through the steel, but can be focused onto an imager at the end of the telescope. And that is what the Chanda X telescope does. The reason it's in space is that, fortunately for all of us, all the sun's X-rays and gamma rays are absorbed by our atmosphere. And thus, to see X-rays, you've got to put your telescope or camera above the atmosphere. And on the right, you see there one of its discoveries, a star that is a sun, with next to it a brown dwarf that is a failed sun. It's a wannabe star that is too small to ignite thermonuclear fusion. The most famous of all these robots has been the Hubble telescope launched in 1990 from Space Shuttle Discovery. It weighs 11 tons. Now, its mirror is only 2.4 meters in diameter, which is about a quarter the mirror of our Southern African Large Telescope. But because Hubble is above the blurring effects of turbulence in the atmosphere, it can take far sharper uh, images. And there is today online uh, the archive of decades of Hubble images which you can <coughs> go to to enjoy for pleasure in your leisure hours. Hubble is the first satellite ever built that was designed to be repaired in orbit. All the other satellites, when they break down, that's that. You have a good cry and then start begging for another 10 billion rand budget to build its replacement. But Hubble was serviced by astronauts from space shuttles five times between 1993 and 2009 to prolong its life. Now, what is an incredible achievement of US engineers follows. Remember I told you that in 1959, the Soviet engineers aimed the space probe at the moon, which is more than 1,000 kilometers diameter, and it missed the moon and went into orbit into the sun. That was the technology of 1959. Now, by 1990, Hubble can aim with an accuracy of seven one-thousandth of an arc second. This is equivalent to the width of a human hair as seen from a distance of over one kilometer. Now, just imagine the challenge that as Hubble or it orbits around the Earth, you keep it pointing with that accuracy at the particular target. It's an extraordinary compliment, I think, to US engineers, to their advances in gyrodynes, in electronics, to have that pointing uh, accuracy. And it's what's made possible those decades of discoveries. Time will limit me to just one of the famous images from Hubble. This one shows dust clouds which the ultraviolet radiation from that sun is busy boiling away and evaporating the dust. Because it's so beautiful, this image was nicknamed by the Public Relations Department the Fingers of God. But in fact, it's just clouds of dust which are being slowly evaporated away by the star. Well, time has allowed us to only touch briefly on the achievements of 48 robots. And those have been an amazing epic journey, and I've discovered so many new facts for the astronomers. The last part of my lecture, I'm going back to that memo which President John Kennedy sent to Vice President Johnson, saying, what can we do first in space before the Soviets? 
and the recommendation was go to the moon. If you try building a space station, there's a chance the Soviets will beat you to it. And indeed, the Soviets did. We start off by going back to a 1953 prediction of what the future space station would look like. This is in Werner von Braun's book, done in collaboration with a painter called Chesley Bonestell. And this 1953 painting depicts a large space station in the shape of a wheel because it is spinning so that centrifugal force generates artificial gravity, which was thought to be necessary at the time. You'll notice its size is so big, it has a number of windows. It has a crew of 50 or so people. There are two astronauts in spacesuits doing some maintenance work on the outside. And at the top of the wheel, you can see there's a parabolic trough. This is focusing the sunlight onto a pipe containing water, which boils the steam, goes through a turbine, which turns a generator to make electricity. So this is what the space enthusiasts of the 1950s imagined the future space station would look like. Well, we now move to the 19th of April, 1971, when the Soviet Union launched the first actual space station called Salyut 1. You'll notice it's not quite the, the elegant aesthetics of the beautiful Chesley Bonestell painting. What it consists of is a stubby cylinder at the top, which is the actual space station. Salyut is the Russian for salute. And docked with it, underneath is a small, thinner, stubby cylinder, which is the Soyuz spacecraft itself. And instead of the parabolic trough, uh, Salyut has simply got more photovoltaic cells, those two wings to generate electricity on each side. And the Soyuz spacecraft has also got its photovoltaic cells. Salyut weighed 14 tons and carried a tour of crew who usually went up for six months tours of duties. And as Salyut slowly got uh, slowed down by air friction and burnt up in the Earth's atmosphere, it was replaced by a series of Salyuts running up to Salyut 7 in 1991. Now, next, the, this slide shows more clearly how the Soyuz spacecraft you see at the top right is aligned by a radar. Those little uh, towers you see, the antenna, so it's perfectly aligned to dock with salient over there. And then they orbit together, so the astronauts got a little bit more volume and space to move between the two. The next Soviet achievement is that in 1978, they built the world's first space tanker. And this docked automatically with Salyut, transferring robotically both propellants for orbital adjustments to raise altitude to combat results of air friction, and also water and air and other uh, working fluids. Now, what makes it surprising that this was a Soviet first is that it was, in fact, the RAF and the United States Army Air Force who pioneered aerial refueling more than two decades before the Soviet Air Force ever achieved that. And yet here, the Soviet Union was the first to do space refueling in 1978. And it was surprisingly four decades before the United States did its own first example of space refueling. And that wasn't NASA. It was the Pentagon, the DARPA, or the Department for Advanced Research Projects Agency had made an American space uh, refueler. Now, after that first Soviet space station, the United States did launch a space station called Skylab in 1973. And Skylab consisted of an upper stage of a Saturn V rocket, which had lain discarded on the ground because all further flights to the moon had been canceled. And you can again see the familiar photovoltaic ray to generate electricity. What you can see in the front was that some of the thermal insulation was torn off when the uh, 
fairing was ejected, and so the astronauts, to prevent it overheating, had to jerry-rig a sun shield to keep the sun.